So I'll start by reminding you uh, where we left off last time. Um, so we're considering a, a stratum of uh, abelian differentials. So the stratum is some set of abelian differentials, x of omega, which we can draw as some collection of polygons with edge identifications. Um, and uh, we have local coordinates that we've written in terms of their uh, real and imaginary parts. And um, we're thinking about the dynamics of uh, gt, which is e to the t, 0, 0, e to the minus t, which acts linearly on these polygonal pictures. Um, and uh, so we have we've have some sort of guess. Um, was that x omega and x prime omega prime have the same um, the same x i x j, so real parts of coordinates, then. Uh, the GT orbits converge to each other. Uh, so these get close exponentially fast. As T goes to infinity. It may be assuming something about the GT orbit, like it doesn't just go off to infinity, but something that would be generic. Um, and this guess came from thinking about this picture, uh, where we, we wrote the coordinates as a matrix like this. Um, and locally, the action was very simple. Uh, right, you're just acting by this two by two matrix on each coordinate. It's just the action of GL2R on R2, um, and so you see that this contracts the imaginary part. So it somehow it doesn't really matter what the imaginary parts. It all gets sort of sucked in together exponentially fast, um, except there's a sort of change of coordinate matrix if you sort of come around and, and come back to where you started. Okay, and this. Um, was a matrix in GL and Z um, that's called the Kinsevich storage co cycle. Okay, and it's sort of the non trivial part of the dynamics because this is evidently very easy to understand. Um, and it's the linearization of the cut and paste. Uh, and you can also think of it as follows. So you have your sort of, you have your stratum. And then you have this GT orbit. OK, so you say maybe it starts off here, and then it comes back close by. Um, and you think about parallel translation of some homology class. So here I'll fix some gamma in H1 of the surface. Okay. And as I act by GT, I'm changing the metric. But the topology isn't changing. So in other words, I can just sort of take this homology class along for a ride. Okay, and in fact, I could take a whole basis of homology classes, and I can transport them all along here um, and sort of see what basis I get, and I get this change of basis matrix, which is exactly what, what this kinsevich george co cycle is. So it's a monodromy matrix um, along this. You can think of closing up the path, and then it's literally a monodromy matrix if you're used to thinking about monodromy. Um, OK, so we want to show that the kinsevich storage co cycle somehow loses out to this very strong exponential term here. It's powerful, but not as powerful as these exponentials. Um, and to do that, we're going to focus on just you know, not the whole matrix, but just one homology class. So we're going to take one homology class, and we're going to parallel transport it around, and we're going to see how fast it grows. Okay, And although the asymptotics of this doesn't depend on the metric, our study of this problem will depend on picking a nice metric with good sort of analytic properties. Um, and that metric is called the Hodge norm. Um, uh, 
Uh, and versions of this are used whenever you have a family of Riemann surfaces or a family of algebraic varieties. Uh, you're studying variations of Hodge structure. So it's a, a pretty important thing in general. So, um, uh, so the, the background maybe is we can start with, um, so let's take x, let's h1 of x, c. Uh, so first homology with complex coefficients. Um, and uh, I can write this as h1, 0 plus h0, 1. Okay, so this is the Hodge decomposition, you know, valid for all Kähler manifolds. Also, this is the space of abelian differentials, and this is its complex conjugate. So the holomorphic one forms and the anti-holomorphic one forms. Um, and I can think about the, the sort of usual cup product or intersection pairing, which just says I have two homology classes, eta1 and eta2, and I... Um, I calculate their, their pairing by omega 1 wedge omega 2 bar. Okay, so this is something topological. This doesn't depend, you know, you can do this for a topological surface. It doesn't need a complex structure. Okay, so just a you know, surface without a complex structure you can do this for. Well, perfect question. So you, you can define it on the whole thing. Um, and it, it's uh, it's just some topological thing there, right? Uh, just something you can do this even for differential forms that don't have to be holomorphic. Um, uh, but we can think about what this looks like on one zero. Uh, so, for example, I'll claim that if uh, eta is in H one zero x. Um, then uh, eta, eta is greater than or equal to zero, with a quality if and only if eta is equal to zero. Okay, and, and uh, actually, you can be more precise. Um, eta, eta is what we've been calling the area. So if you represent the abelian differentials in terms of polygons, this is just the area. And the reason why so if locally we pick some coordinate where eta is dz, um, and I write z as x plus iy, then i over 2 eta wedge eta bar is dx dy. Okay. Um, so, uh, Similarly, you can show that this pairing is negative definite here. So overall, it's some Hermitian pairing of, of signature G, G on this, this whole vector space. Um, OK. And it's an, important to realize that sort of as I change the Riemann surface, for example, by moving along a GT orbit, um, this, of course, doesn't change because this is just topology. Okay? The surface is not changing topologically. But these do change, because it depends on the complex structure. So you have what's called a very, this is the Hodge decomposition, then you have what's called a variation of Hodge structure. So you sort of have these two spaces whose direct sum is the whole thing, and they're sort of moving around. Um, and so that means even if, I, you know, even if you picked a class here, when you change the Riemann surface, it would sort of move. Okay, so you somehow don't really have a, um, you do have like a real positive definite inner product here, but it doesn't sort of immediately help you. Um, but there's a, a pretty easy way to make this help you. Um, uh, so there is an isomorphism from H10 x to h1 x r that sends eta to the real part of eta. Okay, sometimes this is called the Hodge representation theorem. 
Um, so, if, for example, the fact that this is onto says for any real homology class, you can find a holomorphic one form with that real part. Okay, or if you think about it the other way, that this is injective, it says that if the real part of a holomorphic one form is zero, then the, the one form must be zero, which is you know, pretty intuitive. Um, and so uh, we can define the Hodge norm on uh, H1XR via this isomorphism. Uh, so maybe I'll give this a name. Uh, I don't know, H. So in other words, if I want um, the, the, the Hodge uh, the Hodge inner product of two real homology classes, then what I should do is I should um, look at the abelian differentials that give rise to them and then do this to them. Okay. Questions so far? So this gives a family of norms, and it varies. It, it changes, um, but it changes nicely as you sort of move as you move the Riemann surface. Um, okay. And there's also a version on uh, on all of uh, on complex cohomology. What you what you're doing um, up to like a factor of two that I'll never remember is you're just changing the sign here. Okay, so you have an inner product here and the negative of an inner product here, and they're orthogonal, so you just change the sign, and then you get an actual inner product. Uh, but it, it depends on, you know, the Riemann surface structure. Okay. So now I want to start thinking about how Hodge norm varies um, along here. Uh, and, um, oh, and I should say, of course, there's a dual norm on, on H lower one. I, I'm actually, I sort of, in the motivation, I was thinking in terms of homology because that's more intuitive, but then you actually work in terms of cohomology, and it's sort of no, no big deal. Um, so I want to think about how Hodge norm varies as you move along here, and there are two special homology classes or cohomology classes that we'll start off by considering, namely the real part of omega and the imaginary part of omega. So I want to consider how their Hodge norm varies. And this will be the one thing that's really easy and transparent to do with, with Hodge norm. So it's a good warm-up. So I'm going to consider how the Hodge norm of, uh, let's say, the real part of omega varies along gt x omega. Okay, and actually, I'll calculate it exactly. Um, and uh, just to fix a convention, let's say the area of omega is 1. Okay. So, um, So let's say gt of x omega is x prime omega prime. Um, to start off, I want to think about what the, the what cohomology class is omega prime. Okay, and this is actually really straightforward because remember we're just sort of acting on the real and imaginary parts. So for example, you could think what are the periods of omega prime? Well, the periods of our omega prime are the periods of omega, except you've made the real parts bigger by e to the t, and the imaginary parts bigger, I mean smaller by e to the minus t. So in other words, you've just um, scaled the real part of omega by e to the t, and the imaginary part by e to the, the minus t. Okay, so in other words, um, 
sort of the class of, well, maybe I should say t instead of prime. The class of omega t is e to the t times the class of omega plus e to the minus t times the cohomology class of the imaginary part of omega. These are the periods of that. So remember, so this, you could think this is gamma i. Um, and then this sort of xj plus i y j is the integral over gamma j of omega. Yep. Yeah. Like if you take a differential form and you multiply it by two, its integral over whatever you're integrating it over increases by two. Well, so what I'm saying is, so we start off not knowing what this is, although it's going to be easy to figure out. And we say, okay, I don't know exactly what this is, but this is some differential form, and I know it's periods. It's some, it's some cohomology class, and I know it's periods. So which cohomology class has the right periods? Well, it's the cohomology class of omega, except I've scaled the real and imaginary parts. Because that is a cohomology class, and it has the right periods. Um, I, I guess maybe a missing piece of this discussion is that um, uh, h1, say x, c, is h1, x, c dual. So a cohomology class is determined by its periods. OK, so now this is going to be easy. So I want to know the Hodge norm of the real part of omega. So Sorry, I'm just confused. Where did the i go? Oh, yeah, this should be an i. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Dora. Anybody else found any other horrible typos? Um, OK. So I want to compute the Hodge norm. Um, so what am I supposed to do? Where is it? It's like right here. Here it is. So I'm supposed to um, uh, figure out what the abelian differential is, representing that homology class, and then just take its area. That's, um, that's what this is saying. So. Um, the abelian differential on xt with real part the real part of omega is well so here i have an abelian differential and it has um, uh, this real part, so I just have to scale this. So it's, uh, I guess, e to the minus t omega t. Okay. Now, area is preserved by the, the GT action. So um, area omega t is the area of omega. Okay, if you want, I mean, if you think of it times the determinant of gt. So this area of omega equals 1, because we assumed it's 1. Okay? Um, and this Hodge norm, we said, is just computing area. Um, so, uh, in other words, the... Hodge norm of uh, real part of omega t omega on x t is e to the minus t. And 
No, it should be e to the minus t. Um, Uh, you're supposed to wedge with the conjugate, but then actually you have to take a square root somewhere. Oh, you take, right, norm is inner product with itself, and then you take a square root. Right, but area is square. Um, oh, how not? Sorry, thanks. Okay. Uh, and so similarly... If I use the imaginary part of omega, and I ask for its Hodge norm, uh, Hodge norm is e to the t. Okay. So we do have some cohomology classes whose size grows very, very quickly. But somehow, they're the expected ones. We completely understand what's going on with the real part of omega and the imaginary part of omega. That's you know, always the part where we have a precise on the nose sort of trivial understanding. Um, and really the goal will be if I take some other cohomology class that's not one of those, can I understand how its Hodge norm is changing? Okay. So I'm going to denote Hodge norm on xt by just norm sub t. And we have the following theorem uh, of Forney that says let c in h1 x R. Okay, so C is going to be, instead of using homology, I'm using cohomology. Okay, and I just want to parallel translate this and see how it grows in Hodge norm. Um, and I'm going to let alpha t uh, in H10 xt such that the real part of alpha t is C. Okay, we're not surprised to see this play a role because this is sort of what shows up when you, in the definition of the Hodge norm. Um, uh, so then d over dt of ct squared is minus 2 times the real part of some form called the B form. Uh, where the B for form, um, so sometimes it's called B sub omega of alpha beta is I over 2 times the integral of alpha wedge beta omega bar over omega. Uh, the derivative of uh, the norm of C. Yeah. So C is not changing. I put the subscript in the wrong place. Thank you. But the norm is changing. Okay. So it's sort of interesting, right? Alpha T is expected to tell us the norm um, of uh, of of C, but it's actually also telling us the derivative of the norm. I don't, I don't think B stands for anything. So this is certainly a Beltrami differential. Um, and Teichmuller theorists will recognize this as the formula for the derivative of the period matrix. And the proof is identical to the proof of the formula for the derivative of the period matrix. But I think, so the, in some sense, they must be totally equivalent, but it's actually easier just to derive this than it is to sort of first derive the proof for the period matrix and then try to come up with some, I'm not even sure anybody's written down an exact way to get one from the other, although they must be totally equivalent. Um, okay, so, so by the way, you should at least like uh, type check this. This is type DZ, DZ, DZ bar, DZ, so like 
two dz's cancel, and this is type dz dz bar. So this does integrate. Okay. So okay, this is some formula um, in terms of differentials. Um, and I thought about proving it for you, but I decided I'd spare you. Um, the proof is not so hard. I could do it in 10 minutes. This is just a question of, at the end of the class, you might not remember anything other than I did some computations um, that seemed sort of unfamiliar to you. It's the sort of proof that I think, even if you know Teichmuller theory, you've got to go and sit down with for an hour to try to, you know, in private to get any actual meaning from. Um, Uh, or like, could I re-derive those formulas? Yeah. Okay, so here I was able to exactly give a formula for how the, the Hodge norm is changing. In general, you can't do that. The variation of Hodge structure is considered a very mysterious thing. Somehow it's always enough to understand the variation of Hodge structure. It encodes everything about how the Riemann surface is changing. But in a like very mysterious way. The periods of all abelian differentials, or yes. another way of putting it is how this Hodge decomposition varies. So if I know the periods, I know the Riemann? If you know the periods of all holomorphic one forms, then you know the Riemann surface. Yeah, that's the Torelli theorem. Um, Yeah, this tells you to first order. There is GT. Um, XT is defined to be the Riemann surface you get from GT. So I'm, I'm keeping this convention here that uh, GT X omega. But then you said if you understand everything, it's your action by GT. Only if the. This, so this is when C is some very special homology class. So these are two special choices for C, the homology class I want to, I want to understand how it's changing. And then, so sort of what's going on here is now I'm going to pick some other C. It's not the real part of omega. It's not the imaginary part of omega. It's not some linear combination of them. It's just some r random cohomology class. It's not. It's just an arbitrary cohomology class. But somehow we're, we're going to be using this to measure the difference between two orbits um, different spectrum. Yeah, so we, what, what, what needs to, so let me redraw the picture. Uh, but then C is completely independent of the complex structure. I don't understand. So it's not, it's yeah, C. it's independent of the complex structure. C is independent, but the, the Hodge splitting is not. The Hodge norm depends on the complex so structure, it's right? There's a T here. So the definition of this Hodge norm is you take the holomorphic one form whose real part is C, and then with respect to XT, with respect to the complex structure at time T, and then you compute the area. Question? Oh, no question? No, no question. Okay. Okay. Uh, other questions? Um, yeah, but somehow it doesn't help to think of it that because it's very hard to compute this guy. Like, this is a very al analytic formula. It's, I don't really know what alpha t is, but it's something. Um, it's the area of a picture you don't have. <laughs> and yes, he's giving you the formula for the derivatives of that area. I mean, this is not unfamiliar to an analyst, right? There's some quantity you don't know, but you can understand its derivative in terms of what that quantity is. I mean, you'd want so now to you're going to be able to, if you understand what it starts and you understand its derivative in terms of where it is, you'll get some estimate on growth rate. Yeah, yeah, and it'll be a super easy one that doesn't even bear writing down, because uh, we're not going to use very much about the growth rate. Um, Yeah. So the, it's a good one to use because we can compute a derivative. 
And maybe I'll write down one more thing and then we'll continue this discussion because then it'll be clear why this is so good. Um, so let me write a corollary for this. Um, so uh, rather than compute the derivative, it's more helpful to compute the derivative of the log. Um, if we're going to be studying sort of exponential growth rates, um, and this is minus the real part of this guy. I step this guy here. Um, of C C. Uh, so I have some formula for the log. Um, and I'm not going to do these computations because I don't think it would help you to see it. But it's very easy to see that this is less than or equal to 1. This is some Cauchy-Schwartz argument. Um, uh, and with equality, uh, or let me just say with strict equality, equality, If um, with strict equality, with sort of less than, so you don't have equal to, except in the uh, with strict inequality. Um, uh, if C is not proportional. Um, Yeah, so C is not in like R times the real part of omega. So we have that one homology class which grows at rate e to the t, which is enough to compete with the e to the t in that matrix e to the t 0, 0 minus e to the t. And in fact, you sort of, if you think about it, it had to be that way because it sort of balances out with that. Um, uh, but other than that, you get that the derivative of the log uh, grows strictly less than 1. Okay, and that's enough to tell you you get a smaller order exp exponential growth rate. So maybe we'll just recap the discussion. Um, so it's the strict inequality is obvious? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's obvious if I, did, I didn't do the computation. But it's... it's when does equality <clears throat> hold in the Schwartz? Yeah, it's essentially when does equality hold in Cauchy Schwartz. Um, okay, the, the actual way it ends up happening is that sort of alpha t is not proportional to omega t. That's the way it ends up showing up in, in Cauchy Schwartz. So this condition is very nice because it's independent of t. Yeah, yeah, this condition is independent of t. So if you Which start off with this condition, incredible. you keep this condition. And you don't need to the, the, this condition anywhere, which we sort of already know, because if you start off with c being a multiple of the real part of this, then that'll continue. I mean, that doesn't change. Um, uh huh. Yeah, yeah, there's an identification provided by this parallel transport. So remember, the picture we have is, is something like this. So I start here, and then I wait until I come back. Okay, and I, I as I change the complex structure on xt, the homology isn't changing. So the, a, a homology class or a cohomology class can somehow come along for the ride and be parallel transported. Okay, technically, there's something called the gauss manning connection. And there's a flat connection that allows you to parallel translate. But it's really easy. That makes it sound more complicated than it is. No, you, you parallel translate along the loop. And then when you come back close by, you also have a comparison. Yep. So you, on the one hand, you parallel translate, and on the other hand, the bundle's locally trivial, and your, your goal is to sort of compare those. And what we're doing is, a priori, that's a really hard problem, and it's not hard, it's not easy to know what to do. So we're doing something sophisticated by saying, oh, we're going to pick the right norm, 
and we'll instead understand just infinitesimally how the norm grows. No, no. There are, there are other ways of sort of doing this sort of thing, um, uh, like using Teichmuller theory, but everything uses something a bit sophisticated. I mean, essentially, we're understanding this matrix as the linearization of cut and paste. And there's no, except in very, very special cases, there's no like obvious, um, you know, it's not super obvious how to do. Um, Okay, so yeah, the recap is we showed that if you take some homology class and you parallel translate it, it doesn't grow very big. So we had this picture that looks like e to the t, 0, 0, e to the minus t times x1, xn, y1, yn, and then this Kinsevich storage co cycle. And this is given by just parallel translating. What? Parallel translating is just the homology class comes along for the ride. So let me draw a picture. It's a trivial bundle. It's a trivial bundle. Right, so here I have sort of x0. And here I have, I don't know, x, you know, 1 half or something. And I got this just by sort of continuously deforming the metric. Well, the homology of the surface hasn't changed. So like, what's the parallel translate of this curve gamma? It's the same curve. It's just you've changed the metric. But what about the complex structure? The complex structure is changing. So you said you only the yeah, OK, so the metric and the complex structure are changing, but the topology isn't changing. question is, how do you exploit the change of the complex structure? And it seems like the sweetest way is to look at the splitting of the cohomology class into 1, 0, and 0, 1 parts. And then he uses that to estimate. And it uses it to define a norm on H1, and it has this very nice differential equation that it satisfies, which you can estimate and tell you something about the growth. But we don't know how to do that. No. no. I mean, I'd be happier if it was more elementary also, but this is somehow a subtle point. And actually, often I don't do this when I teach mini courses. And then I've been getting complaints that say, like, you know, you make everything seem really easy. And then I try to read papers, and like, it's a really hard subject. <laughs> I can't read any of these papers. So I'm trying to show you a little bit of the actual meat. Yep. Because I don't know how. No, but why can't people, I'm asking why can't people do that? I mean, I could with a computer. I could approximate it. You're going to, I don't think it's going to save you anything. Because to write down that, um, to find the basis, especially with the real imaginary parts, you're going to need the period matrix. Because that basis depends on the period matrix, because that's the complex structure. Right. So then you're going to have formula with period matrix. And then you're going to have to either show the growth rate of the period matrix along a cycle, which we don't know how to do, or you're going to take the derivative of the period matrix, which it, is, in fact, how to explain that's what's going on. Is it, that this is, in that or we see the formula. Yeah. This is the period, the derivative of the period matrix. In that formula for alpha t, you're trying to solve for alpha t on d bar of t alpha t sub zero. <laughs> Okay, um, so essentially we've shown that this matrix, except for part of it relating to the real part of, and the imaginary part, which is sort of 
obvious. Right? We, we, when we had this guess about two things getting close, we had some restriction that they had the same real part. Right? Um, so this is somehow not too big. It's pretty big. It can be exponentially big. But it, except for the sort of obvious part of this coming from the imaginary part of omega, um, th this is somehow a smaller exponential order than this. Um, as long as your geodesic recurs, because somehow if your geodesic went straight out, um, the, you'd always have strict inequality, but this sort of might tend to 1. Um, but if your geodesic spends a lot of time in a compact set, then there's some bound in the compact set, and then you get this actual contraction. Um, so uh, the, what you get from this, so, uh, so what the profit is from this analysis, so um, GT, so the, the way a dynamicist would say this is GT is non-uniformly hyperbolic. Okay? Which is sort of saying there are these stable manifolds with the same real parts, and when you apply the flow, they get close together. And the non-uniform refers exactly to the fact that if you just go out the cusp, you don't know what the the contraction is, because you just have the strict equality. And I mean, that, that could go to 1 as you go out the cusp. Um, and you should compare. So the easiest hyperbolic system to compare to, um, if you're not a dynamicist, is the action of 2, 1, 1, 1 acting on R2 mod Z2, okay? which is just the, the torus. So here you have. Uh, a contracting eigendirection and an expanding eigendirection. So at every point, you sort of have some expanding directions and some contracting directions. Um, similarly to, you know, this is like having the same real parts. Everything gets sucked in together. Um, OK, you actually have to work a little bit harder for non-uniform hyperlicity. I'm putting a few things under the rug. But say if there's, um, uh, no, no, it, it does follow. It does follow. So the expanding direction is omega, and the yep. other directions are contracting? No, no, no. The expanding directions are um, uh, all of the directions where you change the real parts. Because they get hit with the e to the t, and the kinsevich george cycle isn't as strong as the e to the t. The contracting directions are the imaginary parts, because they get hit by e to the minus t, and the kinsevich george cycle isn't as strong as e to the minus t. Okay. So e anyways, um, the main uh, point I want to make is these are very chaotic dynamical systems, uh, ones that are hyperbolic. So um, uh, in particular, you get that GT acting on the unit area locus uh, in some stratum, so the locus where all of the, the surfaces have the same uh, area. So I said before, this has some measure, which is finite. So this is actually ergodic. Okay, and roughly, that follows from um, hyperbolicity from what's called the hop argument. which is a standard way to prove hyperbolicity in this, in this context. Um, OK, so these estimates are due to Forney. They're relatively recent. Uh, ergodicity goes back way before that due to Mazur and Beach um, independently. Um, and I've actually never read Beach's proof, but Mazur at least used Teichmuller theory. Uh, you know, as I said, it, these aren't really such easy problems. It's helpful to have some technology to use. It's related to Anasov. Yeah, you do have a decomposition of the, the tangent bundle. Anasov generally refers to something stronger like this, where you have uniform sort of hypervelicity in a very nice way. So this is sort of a, a weaker form of hypervelicity. Um, other questions? 
Okay, so that concludes the section of the, the mini course on the dynamics of uh, GT, which, as I said before, is sometimes called the Teichmuller geodesic flow. Um, the details won't be important for the rest of this course. I'm not going to talk about Hodge norm again. Uh, that was just to sort of give you a flavor of some of the meat that goes into understanding the dynamics. Um, now I want to talk about, uh, rather than GT, um, all of GL2R. Um, and I think maybe I'll get right to the point with the, the, recent, um, the recent big theorem due to Uskin, Mirzakhani, and uh, Mohammadi, which says GL2R orbit closures are manifolds. Yeah, I definitely, or the fact that orbits are, are uh, manifolds is trivial because they're just modeled on GL2R. Yeah, thank you. Uh, GL2R orbit closures are manifolds. Okay, so you look at the GL2R orbit. Um, the GL2R orbit contains the GT orbit. This is a very chaotic thing. So usually GT orbits on their own are dense. So in particular, usually GL2R orbits are dense. Um, but they're not always dense. You know, last time we talked about very occasionally they might be closed, and then the surface has satisfies the Veitch dichotomy has very special properties. Um, so this says the orbit is always, you know, it might be dense, in which case the orbit closure is everything. That's a manifold. Um, uh, might be closed. That's a manifold. It might be something in between, but it'll be a manifold. Um, and this is something you should pause to appreciate, especially if you're not in dynamics. Um, on the scale of real analysis to complex analysis, where in real analysis everything is false that you want it to be true, right? No functions are not differentiable at any point, et cetera, et cetera. And on complex analysis, everything that's miraculously true is true. You know, once differentiable implies infinitely differentiable. Dynamics falls extremely far on the real analysis side. Okay? People don't prove theorems like this. This is on that spectrum, this is a complex analysis style sort of statement. People don't prove things like this in dynamics very often. They show that orbit closures can be fractals of arbitrary Hausdorff dimension. Like, that's a typical statement in dynamics that you sort of nod along to. You see this one, and you're like, what is going on here? Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on here. First of all, though, I just want to finish this statement, because it's actually even stronger than this. Um, so the manifolds cut out in local coordinates by linear equations. Yeah, so you have these local coordinates given by edges of the polygons. So you're cut out by, so you're even like locally a linear manifold. So this is a really hard theorem. This was one of the, this was one of the big things for which Mirzakhani was awarded the Fields Medal. So this is a 200-page paper plus a 100-page paper building on, you know, a decade of very active work in two different fields. Um, uh, okay, so uh, I'll give you examples in a minute, but first of all, what inspired them to try to prove this? Um, so, uh, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, this, the fact that the, we said the stabilizers are discrete. Yeah, we, we talked about that. It's essentially coming from period coordinates. The fact that period coordinates are coordinates will tell you an orbit locally looks like GL2R. The orbit is right. Well, so for example, you could think about, would this be true for the GT action? Like, what if I just look at GT orbit closures? And there the answer is no. GT orbit closures can have like any host dimension and the fractals. Um, 
you know, the comparison is that you look at geodesic flow on a hyperbolic surface, on the unit tangent bundle to a hyperbolic surface. And there, it's a theorem that, um, you know, the closure of a geodesic can be, you know, have Hausdorff dimension anything between one and three. This is theorem due to, I don't remember who it's due to. Um, maybe somebody like Carolyn Sirks, I don't know. Uh, uh, anyways, it's, it's been known for decades, I think. Um, so really, dynamics is very complicated, right? Like you build... Well, and it manifests what you said earlier, and that is, in general, these closures can be any, of any dimension or any nature. Yeah, there's no... I, I, essentially, the reason that you expect this in dynamics is, is chaos or sensitivity on initial conditions. So you expect if you change the initial conditions the tiniest bit, you know, that won't change the first chunk of your orbit, but it might change the rest arbitrarily much. So you sort of expect sometimes at least, for example, when you have, you know, a, a system like this, that you can sort of very closely prescribe exactly what you want an orbit to do. Um, you know, not exactly, exactly, you know, each point has to be the image of the previous point, but in the large, you can really, like, prescribe what things do um, sometimes. I'm going to defer that question to the end. Um, the question is about period coordinates and like how how big are the domains? But th this we don't actually have a very good understanding, and it, I think trying to answer would confuse the issue. So it's a good question. I just don't have anything helpful I can say in in one minute about that. Um, um, okay, so uh, I want to talk about the inspiration for this work help you put this in context. Uh, so this is part of a general theory due to Ratner. I'm going to present a special case due to Danny and Margulis. Okay. So um, so I'm going to look at SL3R mod SL3. This is a great space that you should be familiar with. It's the space of unit volume tori of dimension 3. Okay. And SL3R acts on this by multiplication on the opposite side that you mod out by. Um, and I want to think of a, a particular one parameter subgroup, so a particular R action on this view of matrices. Okay. And just to pick one, um, I'm going to pick 1, 1, 1, t, t, t squared over 2. So hopefully I wrote that right so that this is a one-parameter subgroup. Um, so I'm going to look at the action. So this ax gives an R action on this space. Okay. Um, and then the statement is every orbit closure is a manifold. And more than that, it's actually a sub-homogeneous space. This is what's called a homogeneous space. Okay, by the way, technicalities. Technically, this is an orbifold, not a manifold. And so this isn't a manifold, it's an orbifold. And similarly, strata are orbifolds. So you're not going to get a manifold, you're an orbifold. And to be really technically correct, I should say it's an immersed orbifold. It can cross itself. Legal jargon has now been completed. Um, uh, yeah. So this is a, a really important statement. Um, what's special about this? So I can't replace this with anything. If I put some e to the t's in the diagonal, this would sort of display the chaotic behavior of geodesic flows. And it would be a total loss cause. It would be quantifiably extremely super false. Okay, so what's special about this is it's unipotent. So the eigen, unipotent means the eigenvalues are one. And in particular, that means that there's polynomial growth. And you're sort of, what polynomials you're staring at them? t squared is a polynomial, contrasted with like an e to the t, which would be exponential. Um, OK, so in general, Ratner's theorem says that if you look at any unipotent um, one parameter flow on a homogeneous space, then all of the orbit closures are nice. 
And this is a super important theorem. People use it everywhere. They use it a ton in number theory, physics, um, algebraic geometry, literally everywhere because it's applicable whenever you have some sort of symmetry group, which is a Lie group. Okay, Lie groups show up everywhere because the symmetry group of anything is you know, typically a Lie group. And then you can try to you know, understand your object up to symmetries. Um, Okay, so that was proven uh, decades ago. Um, uh, what Eskenir Zakani Mohammadi did isn't the exact analog of that. The exact analog of that would be 1T01 orbit closures. Okay, that's the unipotent subgroup. Um, and that's the real holy grail. That would allow you to clean up all sorts of old problems. People would love to do that. Um, they can't. I mean, there are good mathematicians who've spent 15 years trying to solve that problem. Um, so they needed a little bit more than just that. And correspondingly, actually, their proof is nothing whatsoever like Ratner's. Because Ratner's is all about unipotent orbits. And we still understand almost nothing about orbits of 1t01, not at the level needed for Ratner. We, I shouldn't say almost nothing. We understand some useful things, but not nearly at the level needed for Ratner. Um, and I think the, the feeling now is that you know, the 1t0 version is, is probably false. Um, uh, OK, so I want to just briefly tell you about another development that took place that was sort of one of the more proximal motivations to the most recent attack of Eskin Mirzakhani Mohammadi, and that was work of Benoit Caen. Um, who, in the simplest case, were thinking about the SL2Z action on the torus R2 mod Z2. Okay, and what they were thinking, I'm just going to say this very briefly, I'm not going to write it because this is pretty far from the main topic is they said, let's think of a random walk on SL2Z. So say, pick your two favorite matrices. Don't be stupid and pick like one to be a power of the other. Um, and like, you know, give them each probability a half. So toss a coin over and over again and pick one or the other. And then track the orbit of a point on this torus. You know, what can you say about it? So they showed that typically this equidistributes by studying what are called stationary measures here. Um, uh, and so th this was a really big breakthrough because it's some sort of rigidity statement not involving unipotence. And that actually played a role in this, in this proof, although somehow they couldn't use that in the main part of the proof. This, this proof, the 200-page paper consists of 100-plus papers, 100-plus pages reducing it to a situation where they can apply a more complicated version of the Benoit Caen um, argument. So this is just to give you a flavor. This is somehow what you end up studying is invariant measures. So you don't consider sets, you consider measures. Measures are nicer than sets. Um, this is called measure rigidity, and it's extremely abstract. Nowhere will you find a picture of any polygons. All they use about moduli space is some results of Forney very similar to what we just did um, about sort of growth rates as you move along type mode geodesics. And so in particular, uh, we, don't, we still don't know what the orbit closures are. Okay, they're manifolds, they're linear manifolds, great, but like, how many are they? We don't really have a good understanding of that yet. Okay. Um, so I have just enough example to give you the easiest, just enough time to give you the easiest example. Okay. So the easiest example is maybe I'll take this squared held surface, which is the 4 to 1 cover of a torus. And I'll act on this by GL2R. Okay, so maybe I'll shear it a little bit, and then I'll get something like so just sheared copy. OK, so this no longer covers the same torus, but it covers a different torus the sheared version. So I can act by the same matrix on everything, on sort of both the thing I'm covering and the, the thing that's covering. Um, 
And so the, the orbit consists of four to one covers of a torus. And so you can use that to see that the, the orbit is closed because the space of four to one covers of a torus branched over one point is closed. Um, so this is a closed orbit. So in particular, it's an orbit closure. So supposedly, it's defined by linear equations. Okay. So I, at least in this example, I should describe the linear equations. So first of all, um, let's say v1, v2, uh, v3, v4, v5. So these are local coordinates given by these. You can express any other edge as a linear combination of these edges. So what are the equations? Well, so this edge and this edge, they map to these two edges, which are the same. So if this is going to be a torus cover, um, I had better have V1 is V5. And similarly, I'd better have V2 is V3 is V4. Okay. So um, this is the orbit. It's defined by these equations. You can see that if you wiggle this picture keeping those equations, you're still a cover of the torus. So next time I'll talk about some more examples um, and also how we study these things. So next time will be a little bit more like a survey of what we know now. I'll be sort of doing less proofs, but I want to give you a flavor of like what's going on, like what the cutting edge is. Um, any questions? Mike? Maybe we can talk about it later. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Um. Uh, no, 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 that's the input. And the output is ergodicity, which says something that orbits of the, like, um, averages of a test function of some observable over orbits should just be the average of that function. Um, and the hop argument says, well, the, the averages should be the same along stable manifolds, manifolds that sort of get sucked into the same point because the orbits sort of behave very similarly. And you also show it should be sort of a reverse argument shows it should be stable under the, in, in the unstable manifolds by considering sort of negative time. And then it's like saying, oh, I have a function on R2, and it's constant along horizontal lines, and it's constant along vertical lines. Then it's constant. So the, probably the best place to learn about this is you should try to Google for a proof that uh, geodesic flow on a hyperbolic surface is ergodic. That's the situation in which most, well, at least in which I learned it. You could also try looking for this. These are called toral endomorphisms. So what do you do for constant negative temperature? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I meant, I meant constant negative, you, like a hyperbolic surface, an SL2R mod gamma. Yep. No, the hydronorm is gone now from the lecture series. That was, went into understanding something about the GT, the dynamics of GT. It does play a role in here. Uh, not directly, they don't talk about hydronorm a lot, but they use theorems of Forney, which are based 100% on hydronorm. That's the only input specific to the situation. Other than that, it's 100% abstract ergodic theory. Um, 